Let's have you go ahead and open your Bibles, if you will. Um, we'll go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll just read verses 18 and 19, uh, kind of our foundation for our teaching on the precious blood of Christ. It says here, uh, For as much as you know, ye are not redeemed with corruptible things. Now, that means you didn't get redeemed with S&H green stamps. How many are old enough to remember those? Uh, five or six of you, hallelujah. Go to the grocery store, they gave you s and green stamps, went on putting you a little book, and then after you got 2,000 or so, you traded them in for a, you know, cheap coffee maker. Or a yo-yo, yeah. And they, kids probably don't even know what yo-yos are anymore. I mean, you used to do all kinds of stuff, you know, the, you know, rock the cradle and all that. Uh, anyway, how many of you do all that kind of stuff? you never that good? Jeff, you don't need to tell everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. You weren't redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation. That's old English for lifestyle, manner of life. Received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we've been talking about the blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ, and uh, the things that it does talked about a couple weeks ago how we're justified, declared righteous by the blood. Hallelujah. That we are brought into the kingdom through that. We're redeemed. We're purchased and bought back by the blood. Okay? So we, we were not only purchased out of sin, we were redeemed. Uh, and being redeemed, we were justified. We were declared righteous, brought into right relationship. Righteous, is in, righteous and righteousness is an old English word that conveyed the thought of being in right relationship with. Now, most of you have heard of the Bill of Rights. Should have never called them the Bill of Rights. They should have never been shortened to the Bill of Rights. They were originally called the Bill of Righteousness. Because it's not rights. 
You know this, if you're a felon, you lose the right to bear arms. You lose a lot of what we call rights. The Bill of Rights was really a bill uh, that in, was in place with people who were in right standing with the government. Okay? So if you go around shooting people just out of the blue, you don't get, keep, you don't get your Second Amendment rights. Because you were in, really, it was a, they were, the, they were amendments, and they were amendments that, that people who were in right relationship qualified for. What do you mean right relationship? They were citizens. They were living a, a moral, or not really, but a, a law-abiding life. They weren't committing crimes. Okay? And so it, it wasn't really necessarily as much a bill of rights. I got my rights to say whatever I want to say. No, 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 no. Amazing how some of these people demand the bill of you know, the rights to say whatever they say and whatever else. But then when you want to you want to you know, preach Jesus, you can't say that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's you know so we 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 get messed up sometimes. But anyway, so we were declared righteous or declared in right relationship with God, which is why Jesus came was to bring man into right relationship with God, and uh, that was done through His blood, faith in His blood. We were redeemed, purchased. By the blood. And last week we talked about being forgiven. We talked about how that, you know, the grace of God is not a covering that live any way you want to live. And it's okay because God still loves you. Now, God still loves you. God loves humanity. God loves humanity even when they go to hell. He loves them. Okay? He loved the world so much he sent Jesus. And then, and then Ephesians says, while we were dead in our trespasses and sin, he sent forth his son. Amen? Glory to God. And he quickened us or made us alive together with Christ. Jesus came while we were yet sinners. God did not wait for us to get straightened out. Why? Because we couldn't get straightened out. You can't fix you. The problem with man's heart cannot be fixed by man. Why? He's alienated from God. Okay? He's a stranger from the covenants of God. Now, uh, we're talking about, you know, the blood of Jesus. And so this morning we're going to talk about uh, the new and the better covenant in his blood. Um, so if we could um, we have a covenant. I'm sorry. Uh, my phone shared the uh, Facebook pages over here just talking away. I just bother some folks. They're sitting close. I didn't turn the volume down. Hallelujah. We like to share everything so people who are at home, people that are connected can watch it. Hallelujah. Praise God. But we know this. Then in this new covenant, we got a new covenant established on new and better promise, glory to God. And this new covenant was made for us so that we could enter into God in a way that we couldn't before. Now, the Bible is full of covenants. Now, covenant, technically the word in Hebrew and even the Greek word, uh, convey the, the, the uh, meaning of to cut where the blood flows. Old Testament covenants, and even the New Testament covenant is a blood covenant. All right? The very first covenant we know about in the Bible is what we refer to, depending on how you pronounce it, the, the Adamic or the Adamic, okay? Adam. The covenant with Adam. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden and God came down in the cool of the day and he, he hid himself from him and says, you know, why did you hide yourself? Did you, did, you, uh, did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat? Uh, and then Adam pulls the very first pass the buck session. Well, the woman you gave me, she gave it to me, and I did eat. And God looks at the woman and says, well, the way the serpent beguiled me. Everybody's passing the butt. I mean, we're still living in a, in a world of uh, nobody wants personal responsibility for what they did. Hello? You know? And, uh, but then God, then God, at that moment, an, uh, animals were slain. They were covered their nakedness with the skins. Sacrifices was made. Blood was shed. And so we enter into the very first covenant where God says in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman shall bruise the seed of the serpent. Prophesying the virgin birth. Women don't have seed, folks. Okay? Genesis 3.15 is the prophecy of the virgin birth that would come outside the lineage of man reproducing. God, was, he sent his word, okay? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now, this real without getting into a deep biology lesson, the Greek word for seed is sperma. Okay? You figure it out. Okay? Mary received the word of God into her womb, and she, was, she conceived and brought forth the only begotten of the Father. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But so we have the Adamic covenant in the very beginning. And so Adam made a covenant with God. 
and God was holding men. Listen, and they could not, listen, they couldn't, they weren't clean. I mean, they were just covered. I mean, things digressed. They got worse and worse. And then God called Abraham. We have the Abrahamic covenant, which is the one covenant that made it through all of it. Okay? The Abrahamic covenant was, was to be there to, until Jesus could come. And God said, I, you know, out of your seed, I'll bring forth a redeemer. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's going to be one, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't Ishmael, you know. I mean, a, a Abraham decided to try the tent thing, and it didn't work out real good. We're still paying the price for that one. How many millennia later, you know? I mean, you know, Sarah comes, hey, look, I can't get, I can't get pregnant. Here's Hagar. And Abraham said, no, baby, 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 I can't do that to you. Is that what he said? No. no Abraham, Abraham went in the tent with Hagar. All right, they took off. Then they had Ishmael. We're still paying that price for that. Israel still pays for that. What's, what's, what's the uh, message there? Stay out of the tent with somebody else. Hallelujah. You don't need me in the tent with somebody else. But my wife said it was okay. Uh-huh. And what did she do later? Threw her out. Are you here? I mean, you know, a little bit later, you know how, yeah. She said it was okay. Well, you said it was okay, baby. It ain't okay. Why not? You said it was. It ain't okay. Got jealous. Anyway, he should have known better. But he didn't. But later, Isaac came through Sarah when he was 99 and she was 89. Born in 190, okay, and uh, brought forth that that son of promise, and then God promised, you know, and then we after you know after that we have the David the the the, the Davidic covenant of David, we have different covenants throughout the Old Testament, but there was always leaning to and pointing toward and looking for the one covenant that would bring redemption to man. Abraham, Adam's only covered. Abraham was the covenant through which the promised seed would come. Okay, Moses, the Mosaic Covenant, brought the law. And it was just to keep enough stuff straight until Jesus could get here. It wasn't, it wasn't how we're supposed to live. Okay, the law had to show us that we couldn't make it on our own. The law came to show us that we couldn't do it without, without redemption. The law came to show us that without Christ, we couldn't do it at all. Without his redemptive work, there was no salvation. Paul even wrote in the New Testament and said this, that if you're guilty of one point in the law, you're guilty of the whole law. And what was, the, what was the penalty for violating the law? Death. Death. There was no redemption. You don't get to go to purgatory. You don't get to go hang out in space somewhere and you know, work your way up. I remember as a kid, used to teach us, people used to teach that, you know, uh, there were different levels of hell. And if you were good, you'd get to move up to one that wasn't so bad. Let me tell you what. Stage zero of hell is hell. There is nothing good there. It's out of darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that's just figurative. Oh, yeah, really? But Jesus didn't say it was figurative. I believe him. Well, I, I just don't like to talk about it. Well, I don't, nobody likes to talk about it. But that's why Jesus came. All right? All right? Jesus came to redeem us from that. But, you know, there, there is no stages of hell where it's worse for some and not as bad for others. And, you know, I mean, you know, and, and Led Zeppelin thinks there's a back stairway out of hell. You already heard that song? I know some of y'all heard that song. There's a stairway to heaven. That was a Satanist belief that there's a, you know, you're going to go party hardy for X number of time. And then after a certain period of time, we all going to run up the back staircase to heaven. That's what the, that was the meaning of the song. He wrote it, the lead singer wrote it in Alexander Crowley's uh, mansion over in Europe, which he was a professed Satan evangelist. Crowley was. And, and, and the, guy, the lead singer for Zeppelin said this. He said, something came on me, and I just wrote, he wrote it in the night. Just wrote that song, just, you know, boom. So he said, something came on me. That was his own words. I know what came on him. The devils. Anyway. So we had the Mosaic Covenant, which was the law, because the, the promise wasn't working. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't walk in the promise enough. They were, they were out. They were loose. They were, they were uh, uh, abandoned all constraint and living lasciviously and living in sin. So God sent the law to hold them in check. Remember when they came out of Israel, Egypt after 400 years of bondage? They're out there for 40 days. Moses goes up the mountain, seeing God, talking with God. God's appearing to him right in the Ten Commandments. Y'all see Sessa beat the miles of the Ten Commandments. All right. I'm not really sure it happened that way, but it was still cool. All right. 
Okay? So God writes down the Ten Commandments, gives it to Moses. He comes down from the mountain. And in 40 days, what's happening? They're all down there worshiping idols, committing whoredoms, and all this kind of stuff. They just got delivered after 400 years. It didn't take them 30 days to start sinning like that. That's all it took. Why? Because they weren't redeemed. Their spirit hadn't been, hadn't been restored. Remember, God created man in his image and his likeness after his kind. God created man. Man is not a body. That's your earth suit. That's what you live here in. You got to have one to stay here. Without it, you got to go somewhere. Okay? And your choices are heaven or hell. That's, that's it. You don't, there's no cosmic in between out there, you know, alternate time space continuum, you know, that you're operating in another universe or something. That's not there. Okay? You get one choice. You got choices. Heaven or hell, that's that's it. Okay? And so man created God man was created in the class of God as a spirit being. Man fell in the Garden of Eden. Accepted Satan's authority over his life. And became spiritually, now listen, spiritually dead to God. Now, not non-existent. Bible word death does not mean to cease to exist. It's a word that means separation. To be spiritually dead is to be separated from God's spirit. God is a spirit, not spirit. He's not spirit. He's a spirit. Okay, big difference. So if God is spirit, he can just be kind of cosmos, karma, something. He's a spirit, distinct entity. He's a divine personality, has form, has eyes, ears, mouth, talks. Okay? God uh, is a spirit, not spirit. He is, he is distinct. And God created man in the image of him as a spirit. Actually, the Hebrew for and God created man. He became a living soul. Created man from the dust of the ground. Became a living soul. Breathed in him the breath of life. He became a living soul. Actually, the Hebrew says he became a speaking spirit. Better, better translated that way. He became a speaking spirit. And so death in the Bible means to be separated. Spiritual death is not to cease to exist. Spiritual death is to be separated from God. Alienated from him. So you're still existing, but you're alienated from God. That's spiritual death. Um, physical death is the separation of the human spirit from the physical body. Then God created this world that you had to have a body to function here. Without it, you can't stay here. All right, got to go on. Can't, can't hang out. Got to go somewhere. You don't get to go around and haunt, haunt people. You don't get to stay in the old house, homestead, and, you know, uh, show up every once in a while and freak people out. Okay, you just don't get to do that. Uh, you you got to leave. And then eternal death is eternally separate, being eternally separated from God. So those are the three deaths the Bible talks about, and they all mean separation. Because once, once you are created, once you're born, and we're actually created, once you're created in your mother's womb, you exist forever at that point. And say so you would live forever, you exist forever. You have to live with God to live forever. Okay? But you will exist eternally. There's, there's no end to your existence at that point. Okay, that and this life is a bit of vapor. We pass through this life. We, we're coming through here for 70, 80, uh, 90 years, or in Billy Graham's case, 99 years, hallelujah. You know, whatever time frame, this, this visit to this place in a body is temporary. It's like a vapor. It appears and then vanishes away. Uh, we may ask me, it seems like a long time. Like I'm 59, it seems like a long time, but I'm telling you, in, in, in relationship to eternity, it's nothing. Okay, which is why it's so imperative that we, <clears throat> excuse me, God understood that the fall of man, man that was fallen, did not have a redemption, would spend the rest of existence alienated from him in harmony with Satan, which is not what you want to be. Okay, that's not what you want. He wants to take as many with him as he can. He wants to win. He hates God. Tried to throw overthrow God. God threw him out. He's trying, he wants to rule over the hearts of men and destroy as many as possible. But God loved the world so much he sent Jesus. Now, in order to get Jesus here, he had to do some things to hold things in check until he could get him here. Okay? When we start with, we said the, the Adamic covenant, you know, cover Adam, then brother, the uh, Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, 
And then finally, Jesus came. And Jesus came, the, the Old Testament says, in that day, I'll not write my laws on hearts uh, and tables of stone, but I'll write them in your hearts, in your flesh, and in your mind. And you'll be, I'll be your God, and you'll be my people. God was looking for the day. He would no longer dwell in temples made by the hands of men, but in the hearts of men and women. The tabernacle was not there so that God could sit up there like the Wizard of Oz and just, just knock people out and cook people and, you know, fry them for not obeying. He wanted to be with the creation, but he could not because of sin. And so they had to have the Holy of Holies, and he could come dwell in that place. And, you know, they could be outside. They could do all the sacrificial things so he could be near his people. But John, the first chapter says, and the word was made flesh. The word in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14 of John chapter 1 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt, or as the Hebrew, Greek actually says, tented or tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. Jesus came and in flesh was able to get out of the tabernacle made by the hands of men in the flesh and walk among the people. And what happened when God came? And, you know, the Bible says that, you know, his name was Emmanuel, God with us. The angel appeared to Mary. And said, that which we born of you shall be born, be born of the, the Holy One. Hallelujah. His name, his name should be called Jesus. Hebrew Yeshua. Okay where we get the word Joshua from, Yeshua, and then Christ, uh, Christ, or in Greek is Christos, Hamashiach in Hebrew, and it means the same, you know, the Jesus, and the word Jesus, the word Joshua, the word Yeshua means the salvation of the Lord. Hallelujah. Our salvation has come. Salvation has come in the form of Messiah, the anointed one, Christ, the anointed one. And God sent him forth, hallelujah. And then when Jesus went to begin, and he began his ministry, he began to walk with the people. Now God has moved out of having to hang out in that tabernacle where the priests run in with blood of bulls and goats and sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer and bringing all that up and keep offering those sacrifices to keep covering man's sin long enough for the redemption to come so that they could be cleansed of their sin. Hallelujah. And, while, and when, as soon as Jesus got here and began his ministry, he went out among the people. What starts happening? God begins to touch humanity in a way they've not known since the fall. Suddenly, Jesus introduces humanity to the Father and not to God. He's no longer God you got to obey. He's the Father who himself loveth you. Amen? We now have a new terminology that Jesus uses in relationship to the, to the Elohim, the God of majesty and plurality of three or more, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, of Jehovah, <coughs> the, uh, the covenant God, Yahweh, if you were to trans take the four letters of Hebrew and make them into a pronounceable word, technically you can't pronounce it in Hebrew, Y-H-W-H, can't pronounce it. I do believe that it was pronounceable, they forgot, because, they, because the transcribers, would not speak it. If they wrote, when they were trans, when they would transcribe the, the scripture, they would every time they came across Y H W H, and they wrote it, they would get up, and go cleanse themselves because it was so holy to them they couldn't even wouldn't even pronounce it, and they had to be cleansed to even write it. That's how holy they thought the name was, and it was to them. And I believe every time they just forgot how to happen now. So we come back and we put vowels in the transliterations and we come up with Yahweh or Jehovah, same thing, uh, come from the same word, same word, just different dramatic schools and different schools of thought on how to make it pronounceable. Okay? But, you know, you know he didn't want to just be Yahweh. He didn't want to just be Jehovah. He wanted to be the Father. And so Jesus, according to Acts 10, 38, 8, went round about, um, he went, um, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. Amen? Glory to God. We went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Suddenly, Jesus has a ministry where it's not, they're not getting judgment, getting mercy. That when they come to him, they're not cast away. They're brought in. 
The heart of the Father is revealed through the ministry of Jesus. They bring lepers, they get healed. They bring the blind, and they're healed. They bring the deaf, and they're healed. The lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Remember, John's disciples came to Jesus one day and said, Our master sent us, John the Baptist, and wanted to know, are ye who should come? Are ye who should come? Or should we look for another? He said, you go tell John that the blind see, the deaf hear, amen, the lame walk, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. See, it was a different message. I said it was a different message. God's coming in contact with his creation and his mercy and his goodness that he wants to bring to them is demonstrated through the ministry of Jesus. Why? Because he's God manifest in the flesh. He's God with us. He's God tabernacling in flesh in a way that he can touch humanity and do for them his desire and his wants. Amen. He can bring light and life to them. Whereas otherwise they couldn't get it. They had 10 lepers show up one day. Wanted him to, he wanted, they wanted to be healed. He said, go show yourself to the priest and take an, a, an offering according to the commandment of Moses. And they went their way. They were cleansed. What does that mean? Leprosy left their body. Now they still, now if you, under, you know anything about leprosy, it's a very debilitating disease. Um, the, the tissue dies and rots off. So you can lose fingers, nose, ears, extremities. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's just a nasty disease. Finally found out it had something to do with your nerves. I'm not sure all the details about it, but um, it gets into the nerves and, you know, and, and this so forth. But of those, those 10, they got cleansed. I mean, if they lost their nose, they, they didn't have any more leprosy, but they stay still noseless. Hello? Didn't have any plastic surgeons back then. But one of them came back and worshipped him. Hallelujah. And he said, where, where are the not ten? Where are the nine? And he looked at this one and said, go your way. Your face made you whole. Not just go cleanse, whole. So that country, when you play it backwards, got his nose back, got his ears back, got his fourth right fingers back. Hallelujah. Amen. He got it all back. He got made whole because he, he encountered not just doing something under the law. He encountered mercy. And so now we have a new covenant established on better promises. Jesus did not come so we could live under the Levitical law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. He was the last sacrificial lamb. He was the Paschal. At Passover, the high priest had him sentenced to death through Herod. And that last, last official accepted sacrifice of the Levitical priesthood was Jesus at the cross. Where John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And he shed his blood. And the Bible says he entered in once and all, all, all with his own blood, not with the blood of bulls, the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, but he entered in once and for all with his own blood. He did not enter into the tabernacle made by the hands of men, but he entered into heaven itself. Now, if you'll study, if you'll study we find out that... that, that um, Writing about Moses, the Bible says that he made everything according to the pattern he saw in heaven. The temple and the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the mobile unit before they built an actual building temple. They're still laid out the same way. All, all, all the layout of the temple and the tabernacle were organized the same way. Okay? You had the outer court. You had the holy place. You had the holy of holies. Okay? You had the veil that, that separated the holy, holiest of all from the holy place. About six inches thick, um, 40 foot high and 60 foot wide of woven material. I don't care who you are, you can't rip that stuff. All right? Yet the Bible says when Jesus died on the cross, it, it was written to 12 from top to bottom. Thus signifying the way in the God was no longer made a place made by the hands of men. Okay? Jesus, to, uh, Moses had all that organized according to what he saw in heaven. There's a mercy seat in heaven. That's where Jesus' blood is. It wasn't brought into the tabernacle. It wasn't brought into the temple. The priest didn't take Jesus' blood and put it on the mercy seat on earth. God moved out. 
He packed his bags and moved out and moved into the hearts of men because the mercy seat now is covered in the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And the one thing is, he was raised from the dead to oversee his own, uh, execute his own will. How many, how many of the court cases would be thrown out if the person that died left the will could come back and sit down, in the court, sit down at, the, uh, um, at the reading of the will and say, now this is what I meant. What I have, you need a lawyer to try to say, well, he really didn't mean, no, I, mean, I, I meant this. See, Jesus has been raised from the dead to be the overseer or the executor of his own will. Hallelujah. Glory to God. His blood's on the mercy seat. We have a new and a better covenant. We don't have an old covenant. We got a new covenant. We got a better covenant. It's established on better promises. Under the old covenant, they could get covered. A word, the word that we find used throughout the Old Testament um, was, uh, is atonement. And to atone means to cover. And under the old covenant, all you could get was covered. You didn't get clean. Now, I, I remember a number of years ago when I was a kid, I guess I was 13 or 14, we were, we were living in a house. We were trying to sell it. Parents tried to put it up for sale. You know, the realtor was going to come out and show it. And I was supposed to have the dishes clean. Well, you know what kids do when they come home from school? They run right in there and clean the dishes, Right? Let me do a little side story there. We used to, um, we'd come home, we were supposed to make the beds before, before, before they came home from work, parents came home from work. Well, we could stand, and we had converted our garage into a, a family bonus room kind of thing, and they had a window on the side, and you could see down the street. And drove a, drove a black Continental Mark IV, the one with the real long nose, Okay? Hallelujah. That thing drove funny because, I mean, the front end was so far out there. You know, had that little fake, you know, spare tire thing on the back. Yeah. Well, we could be watching TV, watching cartoons and stuff, and look and keep an eye on that road down there. And by the time that car came around the curve at the end of the street, we'd take off and get the beds made, TV off, beds made, and look like angels. When you came walking in the house, well, that's how we operated. That's how we rolled, baby. All right? Well, somebody's coming to look at the house. Dishes were full of dirty dishes when they knocked on the door. I did dish duty. I opened up the oven. <laughs> Everything went in there. I mean, whoop, 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 whoop. we didn't have a dishwasher. You want, to know, you want to know what our meals were like? About five minutes before everybody eating, we're all sitting at the table. Pants! Try and put away, try and put away, try and put away, try and put away, try and put away. Because whoever stumbled, the other one had to wash. And if you washed, you had to comment the scenes, wipe all the counters down. The rinser, all they had to do was rinse the dishes and walk away. So it was a game every night. I think, my parents are like, why didn't y'all just put the chart up there and make it fair? You know? And why is it the person had to do all the washing, had to get the comet out and scrub all the sinks and all that stuff while everybody else is gone? Yeah. This just don't work right. So that's how our meals ended, every meal. Rinse! Yeah. There's three of us. Drop it away, drop it away, drop it away, drop it away. I mean, you couldn't come up for air. Because you didn't want to wash. So I got this, I'm, I'm, I'm just... I'm flying, I'm getting all this stuff in there, shut the door, go out, and you know what, I'm like, Phew. I am so proud of myself. All them dirty dishes are covered. Yes, sir, baby. I'm rocking. Except, it's a galley kitchen, remember a galley kitchen? It was a kind you could put your hand on one counter, the other counter, and we could swing and rock our feet up in the air and all that kind of stuff. Because you had the, the sink over here, the other cabinet in the refrigerator over there, and the stove was right there in the middle of all that. That was about how wide, you know, that's how, about a stove, two inches on that. That's how wide it was. And uh, the, people, the people look at the house, going through everything, get to the kitchen, and they, they start laughing. Where are they laughing at? And they said something about the dishes. And I look, there's a glass on the front of the stove, oven. I didn't have a hand, a hand tile hanging over it. It was still there. I atoned them dishes, but they were still there. 
sin was atoned for under the old covenant, but it was still there. It was temporarily covered, but it wasn't dealt with. Those dishes hadn't been dealt with. And I had more work because now I got to take them all out and wash them. Hello. I don't know if we lost a cell in the house or not, but they sure got a good laugh. Yeah. You just, yeah. And we, we think, you know, that sometimes that having something covered is enough, but it wasn't enough. The sin problem had to be dealt with. Until it was dealt with, all you could best you could do was cover it. But Jesus didn't come to cover. And under the Levitical law and under the sacrificial offerings, year after year after year, there was a constant remembrance of sin. I mean, it, this year you would, have, you would offer the sacrifice, and it was just good enough until next year. And when next year got here, you didn't just cover this year's, you covered everything before that year and this year's. It was collectively increasing. You just kept covering it. And you kept covering it. You ever, you ever start, you know, like, how many got closets you can't get in? Don't, don't, answer, don't answer me. What happened? Moved to a brand new house. You got so much closet space, baby, you can't, you don't even, how in the world could I fill this up? A few years later, we need a bigger house. As a matter of fact, I need a house that's nothing but closets as an add-on. Because what do you do? You just keep. You keep putting in there, and you keep putting in there. And before, we thought there was, a, there was plenty of room. Now it's so full, you can't even hang anything else up in there. And that's how Sam was doing. He just kept building and building, and they kept covering, and the pile kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You couldn't see it because it was covered. You knew it was there. But Jesus came not to cover it. He came to wipe it out. He packed it all up. He didn't even take it to Goodwill. He took it to the shredder. He dumped it. He removed it as far as the east is from the west. And it was washed. It was clean. As though your sins be red as scarlet, they be white as snow. There was a washing. There was a cleansing by this new and this better covenant. As we said last week, that, it, that when he entered in, uh, he, that if the blood of bulls and goats, Hebrews chapter 9, if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, and that was for one year, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, who offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He's entered in, in once and for all to obtain an eternal redemption for us. He said if it wasn't, the Bible says if it wasn't enough, he would have to go back every year and offer his own blood. But it was once in the end of the world he's been offered up. No more does he have to be offered. No more blood has to be shed. No more sacrifices have to be made. Jesus is once and for all. And a great fulfillment and, and, and climax of the covenants of God and what God had used to, in typology and allegory and, and using through the, uh, the sacrificial lambs and the sacrifices of the, of the uh, temple. Jesus came was the last lamb. He was the last sacrifice. His blood was shed. His blood was poured out. But this time, a high priest, after the order of Aaron, did not gather up that blood of a bull or a goat and enter in and put it on the mercy seat. Even that was supernatural. Because when he went to the veil with the pomegranate and the, uh, to the veil with the pomegranate and the bell on the bottom of his robe, you know, so they could hear him moving around. They had a rope tied to his ankle. So when he went in, if they stopped hearing it, they could drag him out because he wasn't accepted. But he supernaturally was transferred through the, through the veil. But the high priest could only enter in once a year and not with, with the blood of bulls and goats, not for the, only the people's sins, but for his own sin. And we put it on the mercy seat. But Jesus entered in now once and for all with his blood. And he's not offered up every year because it's eternal redemption. It wasn't a covering. It wasn't a toning. It wasn't the dishes in the, 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 the oven. They were rent, washed, rinsed, dried, and put away. Your heart has been cleansed through the blood of Jesus. And now you have a covenant with God that is not established on carnal ordinances. Whether you walked too far on the Sabbath, which would have been yesterday, folks. According to Levitical law, if you went, you know, uh, over half a mile, three quarters of a mile, whatever it was, you sinned yesterday. According to the law. Amen. 
Uh, if you had some pork this week, which I did um, last night, at cookout barbecue, hallelujah, uh, you sin. And then this past week I had shrimp. I sinned according to the law. But Jesus told Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And he said, what I've cleansed, no man shall call it unclean. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm, I'm glad I got off the unclean list. There's some stuff on the unclean list I really enjoy. I'm glad he came and redeemed us from it. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. But, you know, uh, he came. So we're, we're not living under that Levitical law. I'm not living in constraints to, I got offered the sacrifice, and I, you know, and I, you know, da, da, da. I'm now living out of new creation. I'm living out of the new birth. I'm living out of a new covenant with God. Not that I can abandon moral code and do anything I want to do, that I have the power to live the way God wants me to live now. Because Jesus in me, glory to God. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, glory to God. The life of God in me, it puts me over. The law, the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I live under this new and better covenant. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So I'm going to read this uh, as we look at what time it is. Oh, my Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Give me five minutes, okay? Give me five. Five, 10, 15, 20. All right, thank you. Just, everybody gives me five, I take them. Add them up. Now you're not going to give me five? Uh, your, but your sister going to give me five. 25. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then they would not have ceased to be offered, because the worshippers once purged should have no more conscious of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh unto the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, he may establish the second, by the which we are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifices for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected for them uh, forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us after that he had said before, that in this is the covenant, I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquity will I remember no more. Now where remission of sin is, or these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, not just out of court, we can come into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he's consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure waters. Let us hold fast the profession or confession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. This covenant doesn't have to be, you, thank God I don't have to get in a plane and fly to Jerusalem. I don't have to go find the uh, spotless lamb and take it to the priest. That's already been done. Jesus entered in. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we pray? Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you that Jesus is our Lord. He is the Redeemer and the institutor of the new and the better covenant, established on better promises and secured by his own blood. Resurrected to be the ex executor or execu ex executor of his own will to bring mankind to the fullness of the purposes and plan of the Almighty. 
Father, for adventure, there'll be those with us today that do not know Jesus as their Lord, have not accepted the redemptive work of Christ, the fulfillment of all the covenants in Him. We trust the Holy Spirit that strives with the hearts of men to deal with hearts, to deal with the spirits of men and women and draw them to Thee. As we magnify Jesus and lift him up, you said, Lord Jesus, you would, lift, you would draw all men unto you. May those watching today on the internet and any of those in our presence here physically be drawn by the precious Holy Spirit to the redemptive, cleansing blood of Christ and know the joy of redemption and harmony with God of all gods, the Father himself through Jesus Christ. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, we would like to invite you to come to know him. We're not asking you to join a religion or a church. We're asking you to come into a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you don't know him and you would like to, listen, we're not talking about a religious figure. We're not talking about converting to Christianity as a... a um, a religious practice. We're talking about a living relationship with a living God. If you'd like that, would you just raise your hand right now? I'm going to pray with you. Anybody here today? Thank you. Thank you, darling. Anybody else?